Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially Mariam, for uh, her help and her support. Um, I will present a work in progress that we are developing with Ludovic Sotif. Um, the title of our talk is An Occasion Sensitive Account of the Indexical Dynamics. So our main names are two. Uh, first one, to take a fresh look at the issue of the cognitive dynamics of indexical thoughts, assuming there is such a thing as indexical thoughts, not just indexical expression of thought. One that unearths unwarranted assumptions made in the literature as how the issue is to be understood. Call it, call it radical contextualist or neo-Wittgensteinian, if you like. B, to sketch our own local solution to the issue understood adequately. So as we know, Kaplan 1989 gives his own formulation of the problem within a semantical logical framework in which there is an answer to court not only to the question of what thought content is expressed in a given context on a given occasion of use, but also to the question of whether the same thought content is expressed again in a different context on a different occasion of use. That is a principal answer because the framework takes for granted that there is a way to explain in general and formal terms how a linguistic expression gets its, its content and extension in context, regardless of the many ways in which something can count as such. Within this framework, the problem of cognitive dynamics, as Kaplan understands it, is whether sameness of content does explain, captures the cognitive flexibility required to return the belief attitude held toward the indexical sentence once the original context of the utterance is left behind. We believe this assumption is unwarranted because if the radical contextualist is right, sameness of content is itself, a, is itself an occasion-sensitive notion, and so no explanation of the kind mentioned above can be given. Accordingly, the question of whether two thought contents count as one and the same does not receive appearances notwithstanding a straightforward answer within this framework. Although the point is not specifically one about indexicals, we argue that it has some implications for the question of indexical dynamics. So we argue that a different account is needed, uh, that it seems one that recognizes that the occasion sensitivity of the notion of the same thought content uh, should be properly understood. So the outline of our talk is the following. I will firstly talk about the notion of same thought content as an occasion sensitive notion. And I will review Travis cases, uh, and I will try to show that the occasion sensitivity of epistemic attitudes and the occasion sensitivity of the notion of proof uh, has as a consequence the occasion sensitivity of the notion of same thought content. Secondly, I, wa I would like to show uh, how this idea of occasion, of occasion sensitivity, what is the bearing of this idea on the issue of indexical dynamics. And then in that way, I will try to explicit what, which are the word assumptions in Kaplan's framework. Um, I will try to explicit those unwarranted assumptions in the way uh, Kaplan applies the character content distinction to the issue of cognitive dynamics. And finally, um, I will try to sketch our own local account of indexical dynamics, uh, exp uh, being explicit, explicit about which requirements uh, are needed for such an account of indexical dynamics and how we can meet such requirements. So the first point is about the notion of same, sameness of thought content as an occasion-sensitive notion. And we are, you know, we are all familiar with the so-called Travis cases and what they are used for in the literature, perhaps less so with how a radical contextualist would look at them, what she would take them to show. 
It may seem awkward to ask how the radical contextualists understand her own argument against traditional compositional truth conditional semantic theory, but note that the semantic underdetermination thesis, supported by the context shifting argument, can be reformulated as a thesis that the standing meaning of linguistic expressions, together with the contextual information about the agent's interest or plan, determines the content of an utterance. For the radical contextualist, this is not an option, since, as we shall see, a standing meaning does not play the role it is meant to play in, the con in content determination. So consider a non-indexical sentence featuring a color predicate, such as the much discussed, the leaves are green. Uh, suppose the sentence, is type, the sentence type is token on two occasions, one on which the author, Pia, is talking to a photographer, another on which she is talking to a botanist, both of whom are looking for green leaves for different purposes. Suppose further that on both occasions, the persons talked to are confronted with red leaves painted green. Um, what are, what are, which are the supposed intuitive truth values of the tokens? So accordingly to the story, on one occasion, on the occasion on which Pia is talking to the photographer, the truth value of the token is true. And on the other occasion, on the occasion in which she is talking to the botanist, the token is false. But the important question is, what is this case supposed to show? As the story is usually told, that the standing meaning of green underdetermines, or in Travis' word, words, does not exhaust the truth conditions of the tokens, the content of what is said on each occasion. Since if the latter were fully determined by the former, word facts being constant, the truth condition should not vary across occasions of use. Truth conditions, content variation tracked by the intuitive truth values, the story goes on, is a sign of semantic underdetermination. That we can confront also Vicente and Dobler for an alternative story in which the acceptance rather than truth conditions are being tracked here in relation to a practical goal. Well, the, the problem with this way of telling the story turns into earlier on a misrepresentation of the role played by the standing meaning in these cases. What makes one true is neither the sentence standing meaning, representable as a function from context to content, nor, independent, nor an independent conception of how things are as specified by the sentence, but what count as F, here green, on a given occasion of use. And as Collins and Dobler rightly point out, we lack, the problem is, a general way of formulating a contest relation that may do double dodgy as enshrining what is invariant to the meaning of the predicate while also fixing what satisfies it on a given occasion. Pace, Collins and Dobler, we believe this is true also even when the sentence contains an indexical so consider the utterance, I am in pain. We can, fortunately, we can certainly formulate a rule that generalizes over features of the context relevant to content determination. The rule for I would be something like a token of I refers in context to the utter, to the utter a rule formally represented as the expression's character in Kaplan's framework. That rule would capture its standing meaning, the, the standing meaning of the word, but still, it would not fix what satisfies the rule on a given occasion of use. So consider the following example. Suppose that what satisfies it on a given occasion of use is not the embodied self, but a Cartesian ego endowed with a disembodied capacity to speak. On the later understanding, the uterus will be false, since ex hypothesis, Cartesian egos do not have bodily sensations. So, to conclude this part, if a general formulation is not available, then there is no way to tell whether two contents are the same, apart from occasions of use. 
because there is a, no overall space in which the comparison could take place. Strictly speaking, we cannot even say that the content or the truth condition of the utterance varied from one occasion to the other, because we could only do so with respect to the same understanding. On a radical contextualist conception, Travis cases can be seen as puzzles to be solved by, by whoever believes that there is a way to, gener to explain in general terms how a linguistic expression gets its, its content and extension in context, regardless of the many ways in which something can count as such. But the, the puzzle need not be solved, however, by whoever believes, like the radical contextualist, that there is no way to account for sameness of thought content in these terms, precisely because sameness of thought content is an, an occasion-sensitive notion. That is, what, count as, what counts as the same on one occasion may not count as such on another. So this, my, our second point is how the notion of attitude, epistemic attitude and proof since those notions are occasion sensitivity, then also the notion of sa same thought content is occasion sensitive. Our next question is, what makes the same thought content an occasion sensitive notion? And we believe that there are more than one way to show that the notion of the same thought content is an occasion sensitive notion. One way is to show that the individuation of thought contents or thoughts in Fergus sense by a way of a criterion involving epistemic attitudes taken by the subject toward this, towards the utterance truth value is sensitive to the occasion on which the words are used. The other way will be to show that the proof sometimes required to establish the truth of some statement is itself occasion sensitive. So the first way relative to attitudes to, to present this uh, argument, I will review a uh, Travis-like case that we presented in Sotif and Marcus 2022. So consider the following case. Consider an utterance of a sentence in which a demonstrative is talking twice in a scenario where the subject mistakes the parts referred to by the tokens for parts of the same ship, and the uttered, uttered sentence is the sentence two. In proper English, it would be something like this is that, but you can uh, prevail the logical form like that one is that too. In the scenario in which the, the agent utters two, while she must, he, while, in the scenario in which the agent utters two, while simultaneously pointing to the stern and the bow, which she takes to be parts of the same ship, when they are in fact parts of different ships. That was a uh, Paris example, I think. Um, since the subject takes them to be parts of the same ship, the ship she is thinking about is thought about under, under the same sub, the mode of presentation in fragrant parlance. Sameness of content being captured here by agreeing with both that one is F and that two is F. Now consider another scenario, the scenario of the, a case that we call the silver spirit type of case, where a subject uh, utters the same sentence, that one pointing to the bow is the same, that, one, that two pointing to the stern, but uh, he takes them to be parts of a discontinuing object. So imagine that the silver spirit has been split into unequal halves, and the subject is aware of this fact. Unbeknownst to the subject, the halves have been replaced by the halves belonging to different ships. But these difficulties doesn't need to be added. It's just part of the story. So imagine that there is the silver spirit. This was an actual case. They cut a ship into one half parts. So the case is a real case. Uh, and I would say, or we would say that although, although the subject uh, would presumably agree with that one pointing to the bow, bow weighs X pounds, he will disagree with that two pointing to the same weighs X pounds. Obviously, because they are half parts of the same ship. 
So they, apparently they don't wake the same. Uh, but the subject will, will take three and four. That one is the silver spirit, and that two is the silver spirit. Uh, it's true, because they are parts of the same ship. So if we ask the question, how many thought contents are expressed, are expressed by the sentence, uh, this is that, apparently it depends on, apparently, or so we are good, there is no an answer to core, for it depends on what is rational to understand on this or that occasion of use. And what is rational to understand on one occasion of use, O, need not be what is rational to understand on another occasion of use, O prime, which ultimately depends on the subject's interest and plans. So if the subject, for example, uh, has for a plan to travel around the world, he will be thinking in both parts as part of a unified object. And maybe he will think that this is that is expressing the same thought content, and thus it fits it fit to the plan to travel around the world uh, with a ship in a ship. But if the plan is to relocate the both, and she is thinking of both parts as um, as split parts, uh, maybe they are, he is expressing two thought contents in that situation. So depending to the plan or depending to what is rational to understand in each situation, we can count one thought content or two thought contents. And our idea is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, there is no principle that defines how many thoughts are involved in the utterance of the sentence. And since the subject is ex hypothesis rational here, no contradiction is involved. Still, apart from the relationship between at least two specific occasions of use, there is no answer to the question of how many thought contents are being expressed or rather thought of. That, was, that is one way to argue that the notion of same content is occasion sensitive because the notion of epistemic attitude is occasion sensitive. The other way would be to argue that the notion of same content is occasion sensitive because the notion of proof itself is occasion sensitive. So consider that if thought content is the sort of thing that is, at least in some cases, in cases of singular thought that are more involving and also shareable, that is accessible to more than one thinker, if thoughts are, if there are at least some those public thoughts, with better to have an interpersonal rather than an intrapersonal criterion of sameness and difference of thought. Proof understood in an epistemic sense as involving recognitional capacities on the subject's part can be seen as providing such a criterion. And you can, you can confront Travis on the idea that counting thoughts in Frege's sense is subject to a twofold requirement of shareability and proof. So consider a, a, a review of the Frege's famous example. Consider below one example of singular thought content uh, expressed by utterance wherein the proper names co-refer, familiar from Frege, Hesperus is F, Phosphorus is F. You may, you may think there is a straightforward answer to the question how many thought contents are being expressed or thought of here. Russellians would say that only one thought, because the truth of each statement depending only on whether a thing referred to is F, five and six are true in the same circumstances, namely only if Venus is F. But this is to forget that there are ways in which the truth of these statements turns on the thing being F. And that should an identity statement such as Hesperus is Phosphorus be needed to see or recognize that five and six say the same thing, what the identity statement says is not that the thing referred to Venus is self-identical, but that different ways for Venus to be, for instance, the first celestial body seen in the night sky as opposed to the last celestial body seen at dawn, make the truth of each statement turn on whether Venus is F. The point here is that the difference comes to the fore 
only when, proof, when a proof is needed. For whoever knows that Hesperus and Phosphorus are just two names for the same thing, Venus, will not take five and six to express or put forward as true different thought contents. So, for example, Pythagoras will consider only one thought content to be involved here, while the members of the Attic Science Foundation, responsible for deciding for Pythagoras' grand application, or the group of astronomers gathered in the field to observe Venus in the night sky, will consider as many involved thought contents, in the present case two, as necessary to prove the truth of the identity statement. The conclusion, or the radical contextualist conclusion, or at least uh, our suggestion, is that counting principles apply to thought content and those, and those sameness or difference of thought content are sensitive to the occasions on which questions such as whether proof is needed or what proof what are being asked. To quote Travis, different occasions for answering different occasions for answering questions, what would prove what, or saying where proof is called for, are ipso facto different occasions for articulating, for articulating thought into particular thoughts, according to different needs to be served in serving the needs, the needs of representing proof correctly. Well, that was the first point. The second point is the bearing of the issue on indexical dynamics. And I would like to explicit the unwarranted assumption of the Kaplanian framework. So if the radical contextualist has a point here, given that it concerns thought content in general, the expectation is that the thesis of occasion sensitivity of sameness of thought content will affect also indexical thought. Uh, and thus, the way the issue of indexical dynamic is dealt with in the literature. Why we return to Kaplan 1989? Because he framed the issue, because he dealt with it within a semantical logical framework that cannot make room for the phenomenon identified by the radical contextualist. As Travis said in 2017, the utopian or Carp Napian wing of the authoring telling model of thought expression. And because Kaplan construed the phenomenon of cognitive dynamics in such a way that it raises the question of what kind of retention will count as retention of the original indexical belief, of, of the original indexical belief and not of, not, not all kinds of retention. Our point here is to show that the way Kaplan construes the phenomenon rests on unwarranted assumptions inherited from the general framework. Even if Kaplan places strong restrictions on the range of possible solutions as suggested above, sameness of content required to account for indexical belief retention is approached in terms that do not allow a straightforward answer within this framework. The word assumptions that we identify in Kaplan's framework are two. One has to do with the very notion of character, understood as a condition to be met by the indexical reference. Another with this formal representation as function from values of parametri parametrized features of the contents of the utterance to content. With respect to the former, the framework assumes that the semantic rule for the, for the obtention of the indexical semantic value itself fixes or decides what counts as satisfying it. For instance, the rule for I, something like a token of I refers in the context to the author, mean to be captured expression's character, would fix what satisfies, what satisfies it on different occasions of use. That is, it refers to the agent of the contents, whatever that might be. But this, this presupposes that there is just one way to understand what counts as the referent of I on allocation of use. And as we, uh, as we saw before, where it seems that the count as relation can be understood in different ways on different occasions of use. For instance, as, the, as a Cartesian ego, endowed with a disembodied capacity to speak or as an embodied self. 
With respect to the later, uh, the formal system assumes that for any linguistic expression, including in indexicals, there is a mapping from a domain, the function's argument, to some range, the function output values, both the arguments and the output values of the function being well determined. The arguments are supposedly well determined because Kaplan assumes that the occasions of views can be typed by parametrizing, parametrizing some of their features, agent, time, place, and word of the context. And that there is always a definite answer to the question of what the arguments of the function are. But this is unjustified, arguably, because there is only one domain from which the values of the parameters are drawn. And the range of the function's output value is also not well determined unless one assumes, incorrectly, as Kaplan does, that there is only one way of counting thoughts or in Travis' words, that there are def definite correct answers to the question when there is one thought expressed or mentioned twice, when two different ones. Uh, to conclude this section, uh, I, will, I will like to reveal the, this unwarranted assumption on how Kaplan applied the character counting distinction to cognitive dynamics. So the, the way Kaplan construes the phenomenon of, of cognitive di dynamics, uh, the dynamics of cognitive states, such as belief states, depends obviously on his account of the semantics of indexicals, presumably because the cognitive states at the stake are essentially indexical. And there are at least two semantic features of indexicals explained by the character content distinction. One feature is that the same indexical can be used in different contexts to say different things, to, ex to express different thoughts. And the other is that in different indexicals, indexicals with different characters or meaning types, can be used in different contexts to say the same thing or express the same thought. That is especially interesting when it comes to explain the possibility of expressing the same belief content along with belief retention in the new context. And as we know, Kaplan framed the issue in terms of the subjects, individuals, attitude change or preservation in the new context toward the indexical sentence uttered in the original context. Focusing on the case of belief retention rather than belief change, he construed the phenomenon roughly as follows. In order to keep on believing, say, on D plus one, that today is, an as the, is a nice day, the content of the belief must be the same and the attitude must be retained on D plus one. Sameness of content isn't enough for Kaplan because it alone doesn't capture the cognitive flexibility required to retain the attitude. Uh, nodal retention will count as retention of the original indexical belief as suggested by the Rimba Binkle's inability to retain it properly despite his ability to remember it and thus to retain it somehow. And this is where the distinction between character and content comes in. Uh, sameness of content can be explained in, Kaplan, in Kaplan's view in terms of two different functions, characters, yielding the same value in different contexts. And attitude retention in terms of character update, the character being thought of her metaphorically, or still somehow functionally, as a manner of presentation of the content. But if, as we saw early, no semantic function gar guarantees that talking values of a set of parameters as argument will get the same output value, if there is the idea is no such argument and no such output value, then there is no such guarantee that the question of the meaning of the belief rotation talk in the, index in the indexical case will receive an a straightforward answer. So to conclude, the last point is uh, our tentative to sketch a local account of indexical dynamics. The requirements of, of such account will be, what is needed is an account that accommodates the radical contextualist point about the equation sensitivity. Uh, it was, what we have seen is that Kaplan's framework uh, doesn't fit the bill, or it appears not to fill the bill because it, it assumes that there is an answer too core to the question of how many thought contents are. 
whether apparently no such, no such answer is available if the radical contextualist is right. Uh, we think that we have to give up two things for, to provide such account. The first thing is the temptation to give an answer by appealing to a general rule for obtaining semantic values, which are then compared to each other in an occasion-sensitive ways. And the second point is that uh, give up the temptation to approach the question of sameness and difference of thought contents in diachronic scenarios in, atomic, in atomistic terms. Or in the, in, that is in terms of independent and coherent thought units for which the capacity to entertain further units in the series is irrelevant, as Evans argued. In positive terms, the idea is, firstly, to stick to the locality constraint on the comparison of occasions, the question of how many thought contents there are, getting an answer only in terms of occasion-sensitive rational understanding, and secondly, to account for sameness and difference of thought uh, in holistic and neo dynamics terms. So for us, uh, that is the best way to account for indexical dynamics, the, the idea of Evans. Uh, arguably, uh, the best way to account for uh, indexical dynamics understood as the cancellation of difference broke about in the content in itself by contextual changes through some kinds of updating, a possible reading of Frege's famous remark, is to account for it both in terms of a propensity to think or believe that takes precedence over its manifestation at a given time, and in terms of the updating of changing constituents of a persist, uh, and in terms of the updating of changing constituents of a persisting thought or belief. That is in terms of dynamic sense. And, and I, we, we understand dynamic senses in a way that is a bit different that has been explained here, because we take, uh, for us there is a priority of the total, of the total dynamic thought over the con dynamic constituents of such thought. So we try to avoid the atomistic framework. And as soon as I can see, all explanation that has been for, for put forward here, are more or less atomistic. Uh, how much time I, I have, just to finish? Five minutes, Five minutes? okay. Yeah, it's just to finish, uh, to apply these ideas to, uh, to actual cases, how, how do we meet the requirements? So let's, let's reconsider a normal case of dynamic index, indexical thought updating. Uh, assume Fred Otters on December 24, right before midnight, midnight today is Christmas Eve, and believes it. Right after midnight, he utters, yesterday was Christmas Eve, and believes it too. Fred made, so, made, Fred made, so it seems, the appropriate linguistic and psychological adjustments. He replaced today with yesterday, modified the verb tense, and as a result, also updated the psychological perspective by, by updating the associated character. Can we say that the same propensity to think or believe is manifested by Fred right before and after midnight? Uh, and our point is that an answer to court seems to be available here, but it's not a good idea. That, that, that answer is Evan's answer. Accordingly to Evans, if what is involved here is the same way of thinking, identified by Evans as the exercise of the same tracking ability despite low level difference, that is, difference that do not affect the subject's epistemic attitudes, then the sentence tokens are manifestations of the same dynamic thought from D to D plus one. That was Evans' answer. But uh, this is an answer to court, and it is only an, an answer as th that is an, it's a, it's a solution that should consider uh, local constraints. For there is no that definite answer to the question of sameness or difference of dynamic thoughts, apart from the necessity or not of providing that the truth of the latter judgment, the latter judgment is uh, yesterday was Christmas Eve, 
follows from the truth of the former judgment, and the ch former judgment is today is Christmas Eve. So what we are saying is there are some cases, and those cases are cases of a propensity of thinking, but those cases of, uh, of propensity to think uh, or depend it, it could be possible to have two different dynamic senses, dynamic Fregan thought, or one dynamic Fregan thought. And it depends if the case demand or not demand a proof between the constituents of the dynamic Fregan thought. So in, in those normal cases, you can have two dynamic Fregan thoughts or one dynamic Fregan thought. And if a proof is demanded between saying yesterday was Christmas Eve and today was Christmas Eve, you will have two constituents. If the proof is not demanded, uh, you will have only one, one dynamic frame, one dy dynamic frame thought. So this may not be something that Fred to return to return. For, there is a there is no definite answer to the question for sameness of difference of dynamic thoughts apart from the necessity or not of, of providing that the truth of the later judgment follows from the truth of the former. This may not be something that Fred himself needs, but as long as there is a need in some cases to prove that the day referred to as today on D is the day referred to as the day before on D plus one, there is a possibility that the judgment made on D and D plus one are not manifestations of the same propensity to think, that there are two dynamic thoughts involved here instead of one. And this raises the question of the abnormal case of Rimba Binkle. Abnormal because, as the story goes, he doesn't make the supposedly necessary standard judgment. So on the day he wakes up, 20 years later, 20 years, 20 years after the, the day he fell asleep, he uses yesterday, referring to the day before the day of his awakening, 20 years from D minus 1 rather than D. Uh, so if there is belief retention here, as Kaplan suggests there may be, it is at least questionable whether this can, this can count as retention of the original indexical belief. In terms of our preferred account, whether the same propensity to think is manifested by, respect by respective sentence tokens on D and 20 years from D. Now suppose we relax the strictures on the standard adjustments and take it that uh, one sincere acceptance of an utterance of an appropriate temporal indexical doesn't commit one to think of the date it designates in virtue of its linguistic meaning, whichever day it is that one intends to think about, as Bosikovic uh, argues. For instance, when one sincere acceptance on D plus one of yesterday, yesterday was a fine day does not commit one to think of D as the day it designates in virtue of its character the day before. Or to refile it to make the appropriate judgment, he can still be, it can still be said that, uh, to have retained the original indexical belief, provided he kept track of D in a broader sense than that of maintaining a continuous experiential link with it, Namely, in the following sense, D is the sole causal source of Riff's belief, and he is representing D as the same day as the one of uh, his original, original indexical belief was about. That, I think that were more or less uh, Bosikovic's uh, view, but I don't know, maybe well, he will correct me. Uh, but uh, again, uh, we have the same assumption that there is a principal answer to the question how many thoughts are involved. Uh, and we, as we, have, we can say a straightforward, a straightforward answer can be given to the question of whether the same belief is retained. Dynamic thought is manifested on two occasions of use, regardless of the occasion sensitive need to prove that the day referred to as yesterday on D plus 20 years is not in the present case, the same as the one referred to as, the, as today on D. As long as no proof is needed, one can say that the propensity to think or believe manifested on D and D plus 20 years is the same, the same unless proven otherwise. And this, this is the final, the final slide. 
Uh, suppose Shreve, as a result of having the higher order belief that he retained the original belief, decides, decides to act on it, thereby, thereby facing the behavioral consequences of his believing that yesterday was a fun day, the intended target being the day he fell asleep, having an inadequate idea of the target, that is, failing to bring his egocentric temporal perspective into coincidence with a public temporal frame of reference, the need may, fail, may be felt to prove to him that the sentence tokens are not manifestations of the same dynamic thought. Uh, but notice that it, it, that, that, that will uh, imply that depending on the occasion, two thought contents is, instead of one might serve the need to prove that an, an identity statement or its negation is true. And that this further shows that sameness and difference of dynamic thought is an occasion-sensitive notion, and that an account like ours is needed. So thank you. <laughs>